helping brands maximize the value of their sponsorships and create more engaging experiences. This is the Market Share Sports Podcast. Welcome to the Market Share Sports Podcast. This is where we discuss how brands can make the most of their sponsorship investments in sports and entertainment properties, create more engaging experiences, and learn from some of the best in the business. Our guest today is just that, one of the best in the business. Rick Jones is head captain and CEO of Fishbait Marketing, a college sports sponsorship and event marketing consultancy, as well as a partner in Nashville-based R&R Bait and Tackle, where he sells sponsorships for multiple high-profile country music clients. He is also a partner in Engagement, a fan engagement consultancy, and recently launched fishbaitbiz.com, an online resource to help small business owners become more successful and profitable. Rick's a leading expert on marketing communications and marketing segments, corporate sponsorship and event marketing, sales techniques, team building, small business consulting, and tourism and travel. Over the course of his pioneering career, Rick has worked with many of the world's leading corporations on the development and implementation of sports and entertainment programs, including World Cup soccer, the Olympic Games, NCAA basketball tournament, and countless others. In October of 2016, Rick published his first book, Analog Advice in the Digital World, A Baby Boomer's Words of Wisdom for the Millennial Generation. During our time together today, we discuss a new book that will be coming out in the fall and some other insights around college football, country music, and more. I think you'll enjoy our time with Rick Jones. Hey, welcome. We've got Rick Jones in the studio with us today. Rick, thanks for being with us. Glad to be here, Jim. Hey, man, this is uh, this is fun for us, I can tell you. Rick, before we get started, we started this podcast um, knowing that as an agency we needed to produce some content, and writing is not a personal strength, but talking seems to be something I do fairly well. So we kind of thought one of the things that we would do is bring some folks in who we um, – we appreciate, respect, uh, who have great insight, great experience in sports and entertainment uh, sponsorship space. And, and and then there's me. And then and, and until we get them, what we were hoping uh, was no, 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 that's good. <laughs> but to bring in and just kind of uh, kind of sit down and talk, people we like, our friends in the industry, people who, uh, we could sit down and learn from. And, uh, and in doing that, one of the things that I thought we would do in starting our podcast is ask our guests, if you could pick one person to sit down with who's alive today uh, to have a conversation with, who would that be? So I'll have to turn that to you. Um, yeah, probably George Bush the first, the the old man. Uh, I, I felt like he was the most qualified uh, president we ever had uh, in terms of his background and his experience, the things that he had done that led him to that particular role. One of the things I was so impressed about him over the years was he met so many people and he kept all their names in a database mm. and he wrote almost everybody he met a handwritten note. Mm. Um, and I, I felt like from that, people felt like they really knew this guy and, and, and respected this guy. So politically, he's probably a guy. Boy, f- three days ago, I'd have told you Dr. Billy Graham. Wow. You know, I saw crazy? Billy Graham as a as a – I think I was a junior in, in high school the last time I saw him at a revival. Um, my uncle was a lay preacher uh, in the Baptist church and it had a bunch of little small churches in uh, rural South Carolina uh, that he you know traveled to each different one, each one a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was you know a big Billy Graham fan and took me to one of the last crusades uh, mm-hmm. that I saw. Yeah. Tremendous respect. The outpouring of affection for Billy Graham this week, well deserved. I mean, a yeah. guy that walked the talk. Absolutely. Uh, Listen, I, I uh, early on in my life, I felt like I was uh, drawn to people who could speak very well, uh, or could uh, just were fun to listen to. Whatever you kind of respect that. And then as I got older, I felt like I um, developed an appreciation for people who could teach, mentor, mentor. Uh, coach, uh, but man, the older I get, the more I appreciate people who finish. Right, and uh, uh, for Billy Graham to be one of those guys who finished well, uh, all the way to the end, and uh, man, the, the outpouring of support for him was, uh, uh, you know, I think just direct, just as you said, he walked the walk and he did it to the end, and that's amazing. Well, I think a fundamental of leadership. A foundation of leadership is humility. Hmm. I mean, 
you know, I mean, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Christ gets baptized by John the Baptist. Well, he was God. He didn't need to be baptized. Mm. And yet the first act was an act of humility. No, no, we're going to do this. I'm going to mm. humble myself. And the leaders that I have great respect for in sports, in business, in politics, it starts with that framework, a baseline of humility. Mm. Yeah, well said. Really thankful. But don't we all want to thankful. die in our sleep at 99? Listen, man, I, uh, no. <laughs> it, and don't we want to – yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty solid. I'd, I'd, I'd like to sign up for that deal. That's and pretty don't we, good. And don't we want everybody to care that we're gone yeah. or to miss us, right? Yeah. I mean, just what a guy who – just such an impact. So across all lines, across all religions, across all countries, I mean, so much international – outpouring the support. So amazing. Well, I appreciate that you're doing this. You know, I'm a big believer in giving back to an industry that's been so good to me, Mm. but I'm also a big believer in what I call your alumni association. Mm. You know, who are people that you worked with and touched and helped or helped you along the way? Mm. That's the real measure, I think, of of a successful life. It's, did you do great work with great people and did you impact people? And the fact that you're doing this, these series of podcasts, you know, hopefully people a lot smarter than me you're going to have in here, but you're going to have people that are going to want to give back by sharing some of their journey story in a way that may be beneficial to the industry. And I, I'm a big believer in trying to give back to the industry. Yeah. And all of our interaction with you is always, I've always felt that. I've always felt that, uh, hey, here's what I know and how can I help both of us be successful? Uh, and you and I go back, we've talked about this, but my first interaction with Rick Jones was in a uh, program at UK where he was teaching on sponsorship or lecturing on sponsorship or however you want to put it. I took it as teaching. I was taking voracious notes. And uh, uh, so my, it, it, as we've interacted as an agency with you um, and even currently doing some things now, uh, I've always appreciated, felt like you had everything you knew, everything you uh uh, could help with you've been willing to offer that and uh, I think that's very true and I'd like the alumni association uh, and what you're known for hey how did, how did you get into sports marketing well it was an interesting fork in the road uh, I all I ever wanted to be was a coach and it's kind of interesting if you think about it if you're in the agency business being a coach is a pretty good place to start because the first thing you realize as a coach is you can't play <laughs> so you, <laughs> you you better get some players and so you know if you're going to be in the marketing agency world you better get some some support staff and some people that could that are maybe a little smarter and a little better than you are but my fork in the road was I, I had been a head basketball coach at Swanee at the University of the South and gone back to graduate school at Georgia State in fact I I graduated from Georgia State with a master's degree in sports administration four days after the state legislature approved the program. <laughs> so, so my then fiance, now wife, was like, what happens if they don't approve this? And I said, we'll go back one more semester and we'll have an MBA. But, but So I graduated with that, and I had gotten hired at Wake Forest. Uh, by a guy named Carl Tacey to be his number one assistant. Um, and Charlotte and I got married and went on our honeymoon in San Francisco, and we picked up the San Francisco Chronicle, and he'd quit. <laughs> and I called him, and he said, I didn't want to bother you, Rick, on your honeymoon. And I said, you think I'm bothered? You got to talk to my wife. <laughs> um, and, and nevertheless, they, they hired a new guy named Bob Stack at Wake Forest. Well, he obviously wanted to bring in his own assistants. He didn't know me from Adam. So I don't have a job. And fortunately, I had done an internship during my graduate studies at Georgia Tech. And Dr. Homer Rice, the, the, the legendary athletic director there, said, Rick, come be my marketing director. We'll get you a coaching job next year. I never went back. Mm. I, I found I loved marketing. Mm. And I loved sponsorship marketing. And that was, that was 1985. And I was very fortunate at Georgia Tech that we had an amazing staff. Bill Curry was our football coach. Uh, Jim Morris, the legendary baseball coach at Miami, was our baseball coach. Bobby mm-hmm. Crimmins was our basketball coach. You were there at a good time. I was there at a great time. And Dr. Rice, who influenced me in so, so many ways, was my boss. And that was my step into the marketing world. That was my fork in the road. And, again, you know, we talked about our faiths a little bit. I, I just believe that's what – that was the road God wanted me to take. And it became such a blessing. And from that time, I can't tell you how many uh, mentors I've had and people I've had. I'll tell you a funny story. A guy named Terry Hansen 
taught a class at Georgia State when I was in graduate school, Introduction to Sports Marketing, and Terry Hansen later worked at Raycom. At that time, he was a senior executive at Turner Sports. And he later he went from Turner Sports to the PGA Tour, and then from the PGA Tour, he, he finished his career at Raycom. Terry brought in 11 guest speakers that semester, and 10 of the 11 directly impacted my career. Wow. Either hired me or helped me or became clients. 10 out of 11. Wow. How does that happen? That's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. But that is exactly how it was my fork in the road. Wow. Where'd you go to from Georgia Tech after that? Well, I did. I, I made a big mistake. You know, I was a dumb old coach, and, and um, you know, when it came time to pay your income tax every year, you know, you, they, you filled it out a form and they mailed you $100 back. Well, I had, part of my compensation at Georgia Tech is I had sold season tickets on a commission basis. Hmm. And I hadn't saved any of that money. <laughs> <laughs> and it came time to do my taxes. Hmm. And I owed $8,000. They understand I'm making 17000 uh-huh. And I owe 8000 that was like eight million. I mean, and, and I was desperate. And my boss at Tech, Norman Airy, had left Tech to go to Conan Wolf, a PR firm. And he called me and said, "Come work for me." And I said, "Here's the deal. I need a signing bonus." And he said, "You need a what?" I said, "I need a signing bonus to pay my income taxes." And he, they did it. Bob Cohn, they wow. paid me an eight thousand dollars signing bonus to come to Conan Wolf an agency, and I paid my taxes. That's where I left Georgia Tech. And I went into the agency business, and I was at Conan Wolf a little over a year and realized I'm not getting any younger and I'm not getting any smarter. I might as well do this on my own. Mm -hmm. And was fortunate enough that uh, R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company hired me to work on their Vantage Tour Championship, which was a senior tour event, and then to become the tournament director of the first what is now known as the Tour Championship, which was then called the Nabisco Championship. And so I went out, and from that moment on, that was 1987, I have been an entrepreneur and run my own agencies ever since. Wow. I love that you uh, I love that you admitted you made a mistake. <laughs> Man. Well, my daddy, said, my daddy told me, I didn't listen to my daddy. My daddy reminded me that the IRS was undefeated. Yes. And he would say, don't get them on your schedule. <laughs> and I had failed to listen to that. And uh, you know, I, I didn't want to go to jail. Uh, it is funny how the best experiences are the mistakes. Um, well, I don't we believe did, we, we learn I mean, from we success. Learn I think you so learn much, from failure. And, yeah. and I also, I try to remind young people, it's okay to fail. Yeah. And, and, and businesses that don't fail aren't pushing the envelope yeah. hard enough. You know, Chick-fil-A is one of my favorite companies. Mm-hmm. If you look at all the things that they've done as a business, privately held business, great food, great service. They have the same pool of teenagers everybody else has. Theirs just seems to be better. But a couple of stories about Chick-fil-A. He owned a little restaurant called the Dwarf House and decided that he wanted to open restaurants in mall food courts. Well, the first mall where they did that was Greenbrier Mall in South Atlanta. And they went to the mall operator and said, we'd like to do this. And the mall operator said, I don't think people want to smell food in a mall. Can you can you imagine that? I mean, today, the only thing maybe saving malls is food it's courts. Food. Mm-hmm. But he convinced them that it was going to be all right. And obviously, the rest is history. But Chick-fil-A used to make what I thought was the best coleslaw. I love their coleslaw. Mm-hmm. But guess what? Not enough people ate their coleslaw. Mm-hmm. So they got rid of their coleslaw. You can't have coleslaw at Chick-fil-A. But you know what they did online? They gave you the recipe. Huh. They posted the recipe. We're sorry we're discontinuing coleslaw, but here's the recipe if you want to make it at home. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But I that's admitting that. we made a mistake. There's not enough people wanting to do it. But for the few of you that did like it, here's the recipe. I, I love that story. That's you, a great you're not story. always You don't always bat 1,000. In fact, if you bat 300, you go to the Hall of Fame. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> but that means you failed seven out of ten times. That's right. Yeah. So, so you do learn from failure, I think, a lot more than you do from success. Yeah. When you think you've been in sports uh, for a while, what's your favorite sporting event you've attended? Wow. Well, I, you know, I, I love college football. 
I mean, I really do love college football. And my wife and I try to look at a schedule every fall, and we try to go to stadiums where we haven't been. Yeah. That's it. I'm still passionate about Saturday of Final Four weekend, mm-hmm. the semifinals. Before the first game starts, when all four teams and all four fans think they're going to win it, mm-hmm. it's, there's no excitement like that. By the time that first game over, quarter of the fans are out of it. And so the second one doesn't have that that excitement that that first game has. But from a spectator's point of view, there's nothing better than the Kentucky Derby. Wow. There's nothing. Uh, it's just the pageantry, the hats, the fashion, the horses. It's I don't know why I didn't think you would go there. Maybe it's because I'm not a horse, a horse it's, guy, it's, really. But, yeah. It's just – it is just – and a, a truly American experience yeah. that everybody in their lifetime should try to get to the Derby one time. You and I talked a little bit, but tell me about your experience at the college football championship in Atlanta this year in Mercedes Benz Stadium. Kind of what they're doing down there. I, yeah, I'll give you the good, bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Um, number one, I th- it was a phenomenal weekend of events and activities. Um, I think they've really figured out how to help fans enjoy. Uh, the national championship experience. Uh, their fan festival was was outstanding. They had a food event at the uh, Georgia Aquarium that raised money for charity uh, the night before. They did a, a lot of things really, really well. The Mercedes Stadium, their per caps are through the roof because they charge less money. Yeah. Hot dogs were $2 yeah. in a pro stadium. Cokes were $4, and you got free refills. But you didn't have to bring it back to the concession stand. They've got these machines that you take your cup and just go refill it wherever you want it, whenever you want it. Hmm. Really, And, and it, they've proven that you can flip the model. Yeah. Lower prices drove higher volume and higher profitability. Obviously, the president came, and it created a disaster in terms of trying to get in and out of the stadium. And I kind of blame the CFP people because if you're going to have a national championship in football, you, you should expect that the president might want to come every year. Hmm. And so you got to be prepared for that. And yet, the gate the president came through, they closed. That was the only gate that player parents were allowed in. So you had a bunch of Alabama and Georgia parents that missed the kickoff hmm. of the most important game of their son's lives. That wow. can't happen. Yeah. It was a disaster getting in and out of that stadium. Because of the president being there, security was turned over to the Secret Service and the TSA. And it's pouring rain, and people are in line. And it got to be a little bit dangerous. Um, I got there nearly two hours in advance and just barely had time to get a hot dog and get in my seat before kickoff. Did you really? Within the sports marketing space, what are you most excited about today? Most excited about today, I, I, I believe we now have analytic tools like we've never had before. And that we're going to be able to track um, the essence of fans differently, largely through social and digital media, mobile media, um, in a way to really, I think, drive compelling offerings to fans. Um, I'm a big believer in what can be measured can be managed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think we're going to have better management tools. You know, for years there's been the thought that sponsorship and sports marketing was a little bit of a black hole. You know, we, we weren't sure exactly what kind of return you get. And I would tell people there's no magic wand, but there is a magic formula. The problem is the formula changes for every client. Everybody's objectives are different. And to, and to come with a Nielsen rating for sports marketing is stupid because in some cases that might be repositioning your brand. It might be opening a new channel. It might be introducing a new SKU. It might be improving employee relations. I mean, it could be anything yeah. and everything, but now we've got, I think some analytic tools that will be able to more precisely measure the impact of, of that. You know, I'll be 64 next month. I mean, I'm an old guy. I'm a fossil. <laughs> and yet I'm more excited about cutting-edge technology and the ability to do that. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I think uh, it's going to make our jobs easier because we're going to be able to prove our hypothesis a little bit better. Do you think there's a – with technology, one, one of my concerns about all the new technology is, is there's been a push for it because the TV ratings have declined because we're, we're watching sports differently today. And it seems to me like a lot of the, and I know there's a lot of different types of technology uh, within that uh, 
space when you mentioned it related to sports. But it seems like there's a little bit of, boy, if we can prove, if we can bring the technology in and prove that people are still watching our sport, we can continue to do business the way we've always done business. Do you think there's anything in that? Do you well, think there's, do you think I, there's I, enough interest from the properties to say we've got to make our sport more entertaining or we've got to make the fan experience better? Well, I think so. I mean, I mean, look, it, nothing in life stays the same. <laughs> right. And so, you know, there was a, a great story uh, of a man in, in San Antonio on his 100th birthday. This young, you know, anchor came to interview him and said, Mr. Jackson, I bet you've seen a lot of changes over the years. And he said, yes, ma'am, I have, and I was against every one of them. <laughs> you know, and that's funny, but it's also <laughs> stupid. I mean, but yeah. a little bit of sports is I want it to be like it used to be. I yeah. want it to be like it's always been. That's just unrealistic. Yeah. I was at a, a dinner Tuesday night in New York with an executive from ESPN and some other people, and we were talking about the X Games. And it's kind of interesting. One of the people that was at the dinner described the X Games as an iceberg. And he said, if you look at the iceberg on top of the water, it's melting. It's becoming smaller. And he said, the television audience for the X Games is declining. He said, but if you looked under the water at the iceberg, it's getting bigger. Hmm. And that's the social and cultural part of extreme sports that is growing significantly. So you can't sell the X Games if you're ESPN just based on ratings anymore. Mm -hmm. You've got to sell it differently about the relationship of the audience to the X Games and how much social commentary is going on post you know, games, mm-hmm. which is significant. I think you're seeing some of that in the Olympics. The Olympic ratings are down. I was going to say, I think the Olympics, some of the most entertaining sports that there are to watch, I don't know, for me, have been, man, give me more half pipe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and young people today, you know, what I call Generation Z, anybody under the age of 24, they're consuming everything in their lives with a handheld device. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so we got to become more friendly to those types of things. I'm working with a university right now that is having significant decline in student uh, participation in in intercollegiate athletics. Their student body's just not coming to games. And one one of the things we're going to test now is can we enrich the broadband capabilities in the student section in their stadium? Because if students can't be connected, they're not coming. Mm-hmm. And so I said, forget the rest of the stadium. Let's just wire the student section so that they have rich broadband capabilities there. And then I moved the student section from one end of the stadium to the other so that they can face the big jumbotron. And now I want to create ways that they can post selfies up there and they can participate in a way that everybody can do, and we'll test that. Whether it'll work or not, we'll, we're about to find out. Yeah. But I do know trying to do the same old things aren't going to work anymore. Right. Good stuff. You do a lot of work in college athletics, Rick, and have done for a long time. Would you agree with this statement? College athletics is a mess right now. Jim, I, I do a lot of presentations to presidents and ADs today, and my first slide in my presentation is a dinosaur. Mm-hmm. And I tell, ask them, what are the three things we know about dinosaurs? Number one, they were really, really big. Yeah. Number two, they didn't know they were a dinosaur. Number three, they're really gone. Hmm. Hmm. That's what I worry about in collegiate athletics right now. Hmm. Ronald Reagan once said that Congress spent money like drunken sailors, but that wasn't fair to the drunken sailors. <laughs> <laughs> well, Athletic departments. They hmm. spend every nickel they got. There's this arms race. They're paying mm-hmm. coordinators two and a half million dollars. Yeah. It's a non-sustainable model. They're betting that television rights fees are going to continue to accelerate. I think they're going to decline, not accelerate, actually go the other direction. There's got to be some sanity to the budget of college athletics mm-hmm. that I'm really worried about. They better pay attention to young fans. If you don't have – if you're a Clemson – if you're a freshman at Clemson, And you're not engaged with Clemson football. You're probably not going to be engaged with Clemson football as a senior. Then you're not going to be engaged with Clemson football as an alumnus, meaning you're not going to buy season tickets. You're not going to be a donor. You're not going to later endow a scholarship. Um, Mm -hmm. They better pay attention to that. One of my favorite sayings is an old Greek saying that says, wise men plant trees 
from whence they'll never enjoy the shade. Smart. Are we planting trees in college athletics? I think we've got some administrators right now that are thinking, just get me to the beach. Hmm. You know, let me put my six, seven more years in and and then somebody else can deal with that problem. There are some problems in intercollegiate athletics. There's some problems in higher education. Sure. Right now, there are fewer teenagers in the population than there are 20-somethings, significantly fewer because of declining birth rates during that period. So you're going to have fewer kids going to schools. They've built all these big dormitories, all these facilities and stuff. I'm not sure how they're going to fill them because there's just not enough people. The only way they're going to fill them? International students at a time that our president doesn't want international Hmm. students. Hmm. There's some problems, and so you've got to watch for that. That said, there's still a tremendous passion around our – listen. Well, I say say that college sports are not recession-proof, but they're recession-resistant. You might give up two weeks at the beach. You're not going to give up seven home games in Tiger Tiger Stadium. Okay, and – it's still about the name on the front of the jersey and not the name on the back of the jersey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we do have this wonderful new set of fans every year. They're called freshmen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so you have a chance to build a long lifetime relationship with a new set of, of, of fans each and every year. And, and, I, and I love college athletics. I mean, it's yeah. you know, my wife, we lived in England for three years, and she still, while she loved being there, she still describes it as the three years she was deprived of college football. So obviously <laughs> I married the right woman. Uh, and, and so college athletics is very, very important to us, um, and I still am very bullish about it. And we saw this year with some of the issues they had in the National Football League that college football was the benefactor to that. Yeah. Let me ask you, um, where do you see the greatest opportunities in college athletics? Did I ask you that already? I did ask you that already. No, well, you told me that, you know, uh, again, I think. Still learning how to do an interview here. Yeah, I (laughs) am. You know, I still believe um, that there's some really unique opportunities in an academic setting to give students an opportunity to participate in intercollegiate athletics from a business standpoint as a differential for them in securing a full-time job. I, I'm still old-fashioned to believe that you go to college to get a job. <laughs> and, and and so we have a new agency called Engagement that I've partnered with a couple of ex-Disney executives. And part of our business model is we will help colleges and universities <clears throat> improve their fan engagement processes but we're going to use students as our workforce. Hmm. And so we're going to t- we're working with an uh, with a um, a school right now where we have 11 different majors that we've taken people out of everything from early childhood education to design to management to industrial management to sports hmm. marketing to you name it and we're plugging those students in uh, as a way. No school, not even Clemson has enough headcount. You don't have enough bodies to do what you need to do. Well, you got bodies. They're called students. Yeah. And you can give them internships. You can give them academic credit. And you can pay them. And then when they go out to the sports marketing world or whatever path they want to choose, they can say, let me show you what I actually did in a real job on my campus in a way. So I think there's some opportunities there. I think there's some opportunities in sustainability in college athletics. I think Mm. we can have clean, we can have recycling and clean initiatives, initiatives that are important to students uh, and and, and to be able to to do those. The Hispanic, this year, Jim, we've had more high school graduates than ever before matriculate to a college. 69.7% of all high school graduates went to college last fall, largely on the back of third generation Mexican Americans. And they're going to, to, to school in record numbers. Well, what sports are attractive to them? Baseball, soccer. Mm-hmm. So I think those are a couple of really big growth sports. There's a backlash with mamas against football right now. Yeah. Who's going to be the recipient of that? Lacrosse. I still want my little boy to play a testosterone-driven sport, put a stick in his hand. <laughs> Yeah, and let's go to let's go to war. I think lacrosse is a that's a buy stock for me right now in intercollegiate athletics. Mm. I think the NCA has they squeeze so much blood out of that turnip called men's basketball to pay for everything. I think they got to start paying attention to some of the other sports and either making those sports 
less non-profitable, quit stop the bleeding or begin to look at ways to make them profitable. And I think they can begin to do that in a way to, to, to grow because you can't let in, – in the case of, of colleges, you can't have football pay for everything. Right. And you can't certainly have the NCAA pay for everything with men's basketball. You've done some work. Um, everybody, when we think of college athletics, we, we kind of walk in and go, okay, yeah, we're you – know, here, here are the big, the big players. Um, but there are opportunities in some of these mid-major conferences as well. Would, would you agree with that? Well, from a fan standpoint, I think the fan at uh, at um, Moorhead State's going to buy just as many cars as the as the fan at Michigan. <laughs> I mean, and so uh, you, you know, we're, we're failing to reach. I think niches, and more importantly, I can reach those consumers m- much more economically. Yeah, and so I think you're going to see a little bit of a shift of some brands saying. You know, for what it may cost me to reach this number of fans at Notre Dame, I could reach ten times as many fans for less money in mid-major places and stuff, where where it's just as important. Yeah. Wherever you went to school, that's your school. Still. And I think there's some there's going to continue to be some uh, some opportunities there. Uh, Switch gears a little bit. Uh, we both do a little bit in sports and entertainment. Um, the entertainment portion, country music. You're doing a lot in country music these days. What are you excited about there? Well, you know, it's interesting. I really got into country music because of college football. Hmm. Um, we saw a direct relationship between the fan base. Um, you know, somebody asked me the other day, they, uh, um, I was at the rodeo in Reno, uh, and, and um, uh, I was asked, uh, basically, the, the guy I was with said, Rick, I don't understand your business model. He said, no, you know, fans. And I laughed. I said, it's really simple. I'm about red states tribes and lifestyles Hmm. college football rodeo country music those are lifestyles Hmm. that attract tribes and much of the college football tribe loves country music yeah and so i had a lot of corporate clients people that i was doing business with that said hey could you help us get into music and so we tried to do we, we we began to do that we were a little ahead of the pack several years ago we had a syndicated radio show through motor racing network called College Football Country <laughs> that was the intersection of college football and country music, hosted by a different country music artist, talking about his favorite school each week and interviewing coaches and playing music and doing some stuff. And so I kind of got into that, into the country music that way. And we're looking at ways to expand country music into college football and college football back into country music in some, I think, some kind of fun ways and uh, and some ways to do that because, again, it does appeal to the same uh, to the same fan base. Yeah, we're excited about it as well, and I think there's a. Um, I mean, nothing moves people like sports and, and music, um, right? And so, very passionate platform. And then we're adding, and as you are, the food element. Yes, I mean, I mean, music, sport, and food. Yeah, uh, I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> and, and, and what's interesting is this: you know, when Ray Charles died, he endowed a scholarship at Dillard University a historically black college in New Orleans, not in music, but in culinary arts. Did really? Because he said in his lifetime of growing up from a Jim Crow era to an era of full acceptance that he found what brought people together were food and music. Huh. And I would argue food, music, and sport. Yeah. That shared experience. I love to go to college tailgate parties with fans that will even tell the opposite fans, get in here. Get in here and get a get Come some chicken. Come in here and get a little dip here. Get a, I mean, that that shared collective experience we've is done, so so powerful. Absolutely, we've we've done some work uh, in the HBCU space, and we uh, I will tell you to this day my favorite event I've ever attended, activation we've ever done, was at the Magic City Classic in Birmingham, Alabama, and it was just that. It was uh, we did it for Kingsford. We were on site, and we. I've never been more welcomed. I've never been. I've never eaten better food at a tailgate, and uh, it's one of those events. Fifty-five thousand people in the stands and one hundred ten thousand outside at the party, and uh, uh, it's really kind of a cool. That experience. shared experience, I think, in a world that we're all connected electronically, we miss that. We 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 nest in our own little worlds and our own little Facebook pages and our own little things, but. That day is a more of a collective experience. Yeah, um, I do worry 
that what's wrong with our country politically, though, is we only spend time with people like us. Hmm. Like my daddy told me one of the smartest things that happened in his life was being drafted into the Army. Hmm. He was a boy from Atlanta, Georgia. He was an only child, and he was drafted. He had been a police officer for a couple of years in the city of Atlanta police and was drafted to go to Korea. Well, they put him in a Native American Oklahoma unit. And they put him in there because he was a cop. And they said, we need, we need somebody to, to maybe help the, the Native Americans, you know, toe the line and not maybe get drunk and crazy stuff. He said it changed his life. He, he, he began to understand a different culture, a different people. And it, it made him, it changed his life so dramatically. I think in our country, we made a mistake doing away with the draft. I think at that point, the haves and the have-nots learn to respect one another. I think I would do two things if I, if I were running the country. I would, Wait a minute. Take notes. I would okay. quit making. I would. <laughs> I would not let Congress go home for the weekend. Hmm. I'd make them play golf and drink and picnic together, hmm. and get to know one another. See, they don't do that anymore. They fly in. They fly back to their constituents. All they hear is people that think and act them same. So there's none of that. The second thing, though, I would do is when it's time to pass real legislation. I would put them in a room and say, "You can't leave until you pass it." And every 15 minutes, I'm going to turn the thermostat up one degree. So several hours later, they'll all be in their underwear, but we'll get compromise legislation passed. What I'm trying to say is yeah. what the beauty of college athletics is we have shared values and shared experiences. Huh. We need more of that in our, our country, I think, right now. Because here's what I would really believe. I think there's more good than bad, and I think there are more commonalities than differences. Hmm. The beauty of game day at Tiger Stadium is it's our commonalities. Go Tigers. Yeah. But go Tigers, but respect for the Georgia Tech fans that are there. Right. Or the Gamecock fans that are there. Right. Or the North Carolina fans that are there. That's the beauty of that shared experience. That's a beautiful thing, no doubt about it. Well, let me ask you this. You uh, you wrote a book recently, uh, uh, talk, Analog Advice in a Digital World, it, and it's a baby boomer's words of wisdom for the millennial generation. Talk to me about your book. We we ordered about ten copies. I think I gave them all away. I think I, uh, I ordered one the other day. Uh, I think I ordered the last one on Amazon. You're out. You may need to to re, replenish. Re, yeah, republish. But it, it you know my kids would would laughingly tell me over the years you know what they called dad isms or coach isms. They said you ought to write a book of all these isms because we've heard them all knowledge ago. Maybe yeah. somebody else needs to hear them. So I wrote a very simple, what I call a soundbite book. It's 52 chapters, and it's 52 of my favorite sayings and what it means, and it's just common sense. It's just about how do you relate to people? How do you relate to business? How do you improve yourself in a way? I I gave a book uh, away yesterday to, to a guy, and I said, it's one airplane flight or 52 trips to the bathroom you pick you pick <laughs> uh it's when always, i first got it i thought i would read one a week and i was like wait a minute i said i didn't read like 10 before i y- yeah it started, it's, so. it's, it, it, it's they're not very long right. but but they're just and a lot of them are the things that i've stolen from other people just common sense and my favorite sayings and some of that kind of stuff that that i believe in and um and i just wanted to be able to kind of share that with a new generation of of young people that um uh, just some ways for them to get ahead and improve their lives. Well, let me this, let me ask you about a couple of examples, a couple of chapters, for examples here. So, mediocrity is excellence to the mediocre. <laughs> That's chapter one. That's kind of the foundation of the whole thing. Uh, and I have to laugh at that. You know, there's a lot of people that really think mediocrity is excellence. Yes. Well, it is if you're mm-hmm. mediocre. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very blessed to be in the one percent. I have, I've worked really hard, and I'm blessed to be in the 1%. Hmm. It's crowded at the bottom. There's more room up here. Hmm. Get up here. Yeah. Don't try to pull others down. Let's go up to the top. Don't be mediocre or anything. Whatever you choose to do, be the best you can be at it. Um, my daddy said, if you're going to you know, sweep streets, do it right. Hmm. You know, to be the best you can be. Bob Knight had a great definition of success. He said, success is performing to the limits of your potential. Don't mm. you love that definition? Yeah, I do. The, the, the limits of your potential. Yeah. And that means you can be great. 
no matter what your economic situation is, no matter about your background, who your mom and daddy were, no matter the color of your skin, where you come from, you can be great if you want to be great. Good stuff. All hat and no cattle. <laughs> well, that's yeah, that's one of my favorite sayings. You know, we it, it, the, the, that's the shortest chapter in the book. It just says we all know that guy. You know, the guy with none of the experience and all of the answers. Don't be that guy. Huh. I mean, just don't be that guy. One of my other favorite chapters is a, is one called "Remember, even the Lone Ranger didn't travel alone." Hmm. You know, life, business, sport, everything's a team sport. Yeah, everything's a team sport. You know. The the best thing I have ever done in my life was the woman that I tricked into marrying me, hmm. you know. And I tell young people, your your life's mate, your spouse, is going to make or break you. Hmm. And I'm very fortunate to have a spouse that's made me better than I ever thought I could possibly be. And I've been blessed to have friends like you business colleagues, people that I've worked for, people that have worked for me. Hmm. I've been so enriched by other human beings. Hmm. And I want people to embrace other people and to embrace people that have differing opinions. Yeah. Because as Jimmy Buffett said in um, his song, Manana, you just might turn out to be wrong. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. And so listen to somebody else's perspective. Because, you know, Jim, here's the tr- truth. In our business lives, in our personal lives, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. Yeah. And that can be dangerous sometimes. Yeah. You can get myopic. I think you have to look at the world from somebody else's eyes, especially if you're going to be in marketing. Yeah. Because you're selling to a broad base of constituents out there what's important to them and how do we meet those needs. Yeah. There was a movie that came out a couple of years ago with Helen Mirren. Uh, she is a French... Uh, restaurant yeah, owner. Yeah, Indian restaurant yeah. opens across the street. It, it, it is. I think it's called uh, a, a Thousand Steps or a Hundred yeah. Steps or whatever. Good movie. It, it really illustrates what you said. Yeah. I had a perception. I walked across the street. I was totally wrong in my perception. Right. We got to walk across the street a little bit more. You know, I'm, I'm writing a second book. In fact, it's in final edits. My daughter, who is a published author with Penguin, is my editor, which is works out pretty well. She's yeah. looking after my best interest, and she's yeah. a lot better writer than I am. <laughs> but this one's called The Business Tithe. And it is a book aimed at small business owners like me and like you. I'm convinced that small businesses in America and small business owners can create a revolution. And that revolution is a revolution of giving back. And so the challenge is it's seven steps for the seven days that God created the earth, seven steps to make your business better, with the seventh step being the business tithe, Hmm. which says if every small business in America, no matter how big or how small, would give 10% of their profits to something they're passionate about, I don't need the federal government. I mean, I'll fill food banks, I'll fill Little League stadiums, I'll feed battered shelter, whatever. We can do that collectively. There are 26 million small businesses in America that make less than $2 million a year in gross income. Hmm. 10% of that back, we can really do some powerful things. Because if my favorite chapter in the Bible is the 21st chapter of John. And Peter's one of my favorite characters because he's flawed like me. He's kind of a guy's guy, but he's so flawed. Mm. Um, But at the end of the payoff is he finally, the light bulb goes off, and he turns to the the resurrected Jesus and says, what do you want me to do? And Jesus says three times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Well, number one, only profitable business can can feed sheep. Mm. So I'm a big capitalist. (laughs) But if you're going to create value, you got to give value back. And that's go feed sheep. Hmm. In your first flock's your family. And in our business, it's then the people that work for us. Right. And then it's our customers. Then it's our vendors. Then it's our church, community, country, world in that order. Right. And so I'm excited about that book, and uh, you'll get one of the first copies when it comes oh, out listen, this fall. I'm excited about it. Looking forward to it. Well, let's have a little fun. So one of the things that um, – uh, to kind of wrap this up, one of the things that you've also done is uh, you have put some stuff out on Facebook on the road with Rick, <laughs> and uh, this is we've we've kind of played this game before, but I, I and so I'm kind of been looking forward to it, uh, having a chance to do this again with you. But at, 
the on the road with Rick is your take on the best restaurants in the best cities you're you're visiting, your recommendations on on places to eat. So I got a few cities for you. I want to ask you about. All right. So let's start out with the favorite thing you ever ate or the, your favorite restaurant in Boston, Massachusetts. Well, actually, my favorite restaurant in Boston is not in Boston, but it's close enough. Okay. Okay. The regional yes. work here. So I've been known to give myself a several hour gap to fly into Logan and drive just north of Boston to Cape Ann to a little town called Essex, Massachusetts. Okay. And there's a restaurant there called Woodman's. They claim they invented the fried clam in 1922 there. It sits on an estuary. You get in three lines. The first line is outside, and it's to pick out how big you want your lobster. The second line is steamers, fried food, clam chowder, corn, potatoes. And the third line is soft drinks, tea, or cold beers. Let me tell you, it is my favorite fry house in the world, maybe my favorite restaurant in the world, you eat till it ouches. I mean, it's <laughs> some kind of good. <laughs> All right, Tallahassee, Florida. You know, you asked me that before, and 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 and, and once before. Wait, don't about this. don't give me a different answer. Yeah. No, I, I told you. Me. I told you before when you asked me about that, and you you have you have a, a business colleague that actually went to Florida State. Yeah. My favorite restaurant in Tallahassee is a Waffle House. I can't find <laughs> anything. <laughs> memorable in Tallahassee, Florida. And so every time I go to Tallahassee, there's an exit. On, it's, my wife is from Live Oak. And Live Oak is about an hour east of Tallahassee. In fact, it's halfway between Jacksonville and Tallahassee. So it's not like you had not been and, there. No, no. I've been there a bunch. Yeah. The exit after we leave Tallahassee, there's a Waffle House. That's where I tend to eat. Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, boy. What a great food town. Uh, Prince's Chicken. Uh, spicy. I mean... Spicy, spicy, spicy chicken. It, old African American guy runs the place. It's it's phenomenal. I have a friend that runs the Omni Hotel right there where the Country Music Hall of Fame is. They have a restaurant called Kitchen Notes that has the best breakfast buffet in the country. They have like nine mm. kinds of biscuits every morning: cheese biscuits, gluten free biscuits, buttermilk biscuit. I mean, it, it and and they get their jams and jellies from the Loveless Cafe, which is out in. West Nashville at the end of the, Nat- uh, the Natchez Trace. So it's it's kind of a local thing that's really good. Husk, who has a restaurant in Charleston, now has a restaurant in Nashville that all the ingredients are from the south. It's really, really good. I'm um, just kind of a trick one here. Davidson, North Carolina. Well, Davidson, there's a, there's a farm-to-table place right across from the campus that I can't even remember the name, and that's little small plates that's just – Killer, killer, killer good. I'll have to, uh, I was, then I also have to give a plug out to our car burritos. The best burrito you ever had in Davidson. And salsas. <laughs> Choices of <laughs> salsas, salsas which good. I they like. No, no, no. Yeah, no Some place gives you one kind of salsa. I like yeah. a place that says, here's 10 salsas. All what fresh, you and here you yeah. go. Yeah, highly I'm recommend. a big salsa guy. Charleston, South Carolina. Well, it's and not, I, we it's, can yeah. expand that it's, out yeah, to the region. No, it's my hometown, and, yep. and, and it is a phenomenal food town. It's a, and, and so, boy, it's kind of like asking you, what's your favorite child? <laughs> there is a place there called Leon's Chicken and Oysters in an old gas station on Upper King Street. They do grilled oysters, and they do fried chicken that will make you spank your grandmama. And it, 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 it is, it is, it's a cool, cool place. Out where we live, out in Wadmala on Johns Island, is a place called the Wild Olive, which is low country Italian. I've never had a bad meal there. Um, we eat at the bar, and we know the bartender. We've, you know, he's had three kids. We've been yeah. around for all the pregnancies and know all the kids, and 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 it's it's phenomenal food. The ordinary Mike Lotta's restaurant. It's in an old bank building. All seafood, spectacular restaurant. You can't. I mean, if you're bad in it Charleston, is a good town. If you're bad in Charleston, you're out of business. There are too many good choices. Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's a great. It's my it's my second favorite food town in the country. My favorite food town is still New Orleans. I mean, and my favorite restaurant there is called the Upper Line, Joanne Clevenger's place up up, mm. up in towards the Garden District. Um, they invented the fried green tomato there, mm. shrimp romalade. It's, it's in an old house, and she treats you like you're eating in her house. 
Hmm. She's there every night. She comes and sits with you. I, I sent a bunch of my Clemson friends when they went to the Sugar Bowl this year for the Alabama game. I said, you got to go to the upper line. And they just took it over, and Joanne was great. And I got some pictures on my phone of them with Joanne and Go Tigers. And it's if, if you haven't eaten at the upper line upper in line. New Orleans, you got to go to the upper line. Last time I was in New Orleans was for Super Bowl, and uh, we had a guy who was dedicated to finding us every our places to eat lunch and dinner every day for a week. And uh, about half the places had no signs on the front door. So I don't know if I've eaten there or not. And it's been a while. But uh, There's another place outside of New Orleans in Avondale, Louisiana, on the other side of the Talmadge Bridge, uh, of the Huey Long Bridge, called Moscas. And it's a cool story. Mob bo- uh, a mob boss gets reassigned <laughs> from New York to New Orleans. Okay. And he can't find Italian food like he likes. So rather than... He brings his chef down, and he, he opens his restaurant in Avondale, which we laughingly say it's about halfway between where they dump the bodies in the swamp <laughs> and back to New Orleans. Mosca's nondescript building, all white tablecloths, all Italian wines, Sinatra on the jukebox, and Italian Creole food, oysters Mosca, chicken cacciatore, Good phenomenal stuff. food. you got to go stuff. to Mosca's. All right. Well, listen, Rick. Cannot thank you enough for taking the time to be with us. Always enjoyable. This has been fantastic. Appreciate so, the opportunity. Thanks again. Thank you. Appreciate it. This has been the Market Share Sports Podcast, dedicated to helping brands maximize their sponsorships and create more engaging experiences. Visit us at marketsharesports.com to learn more about our work, catch up on past episodes, and sign up for our newsletter. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thanks again for joining us.